a quick programming note. You may have noticed for the past couple of weeks I have not updated the podcast. Unfortunately, I wound up in the hospital unexpectedly and have been unable to do much. But I am back in health. To some degree, I'm in recovery, but I'm back with the podcast. So, a quick note about this episode. This episode was supposed to air a few weeks ago during the Southern Baptist Convention in Anaheim. Again, I wasn't expecting to be in the hospital that morning. So, um, what you're going to hear is a is a message, a interview about the abuse scandal within the Southern Baptist Church that was supposed to air during the convention where they're going to grapple with some of these issues. So you're going to hear me reference that quite a bit with my guest. And thank you, uh, Jennifer Greenberg, for your uh, patience with me as I've waited to update and uh, post this episode. So without any further ado, let's start the show. Hello and welcome back to the Basic Bible Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Thompson, and uh, joining us again is Jennifer Greenberg. Jennifer, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Kevin. Well, last time you were on, you were talking about your book, Not Forsaken. Yes. And um, unfortunately, we're going to continue that conversation. (laughs) Um, And I say unfortunately because right now, uh, actually, we're recording this on Friday. This will air on um, Monday, which will also be the beginning of the annual Southern Baptist Convention. Yes, this year being held in Anaheim, mm-hmm. and I mean they're they're they've got lots of stuff to debate and argue about who's going to be their next president, and uh, whether it's going to be Tom Askell or somebody else or uh, Bart Barber, who actually liked one of my tweets. So that says yeah, a- Bart's a really yeah. cool guy. <laughs> um. So, uh, and, and Tom was supposed to be on the podcast. I take Tom like I, like I know him. Um, <laughs> he was supposed to be on our podcast when we were going through our series on Calvinism, but unfortunately, oh, yeah. we didn't work that out. Uh, oh, no. But, uh, the big thing they're going to be talking about is the big guidepost report uh, yes. concerning uh, child abuse and molestation within the convention. And mm-hmm. uh, Jennifer, I mean, your, your book is about abuse and not just your own testimony, but exposing uh, the larger problem. Because, you know, when I grew up, this was a Catholic thing. Yeah. Um, I remember as a kid that, you know, the Catholic Church was going through their, their priest scandal. I'm so glad that wasn't happening <laughs> by Baptist Church. Yeah. <laughs> and as I began to grow older, the more people <laughs> I interact with, I find out, oh, this isn't just a Catholic problem. Yeah. This is a church problem in general, but. Yeah, um, it's a human problem. I mean, yeah. anywhere, yeah, anywhere where there's people, there will be sin. And um, unfortunately, some people are very, very sinful and feed their sin instead of repenting of it. And so the upshot is that we wind up with abuse. So why do you think so many abusers are drawn to the church? Um. I think it's a very practical uh, reason. I think that Christians tend to uh, be naive and innocent. Um, They tend to want to believe good things about others. They tend to want to think that everyone has their same motivations at heart. And so we tend to assume that, oh, well, you know, if, if so-and-so wants to teach at church or so-and-so wants to volunteer in childcare or so-and-so, you know, wants to uh, be more involved in our children's ministry, then so-and-so must have good motives because those are the motives that I have. And so um, there's that issue, but there's also just the issue of the accessibility of victims. Yeah. Um, I think that abusers infiltrate churches for the same reason that we're seeing a lot of abusers and child predators infiltrating the school system. There are kids there and they want kids. Um, It's the same reason that that wolves, you know, will hang out around a sheep pasture. It's because that's where the sheep are. And so um, I think it's as simple as that. 
Yeah, I also, you know, I, my wife and I adopted some children out of foster care. And so for the first time, we had to actually care about uh, who's running the nursery and yes. who is involved in Sunday school because we had certain laws, regulations that we had to follow in order to put our kid somewhere. And it done in the sense like, wow, um, a lot of churches, we've, and I do a lot of uh, pulpit supplies. So I go from church to church and, and realize. And a lot of churches, it's just, you know, it's, it's not even a matter of background check. It's just who can do it. Right. You know, we get these kids coming in. Oh, I guess we got to have some, find somebody to do nursery. Whoever wants to do it, go for it. Yeah, Whether especially. You know, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a struggle even in, you know, I've recently been attending a church that has, I would guess, maybe 200 uh, members. Uh, it's a struggle in that church. But I've been in churches where, you know, they've got 50 members and, you know, if you've got 50 members and, um, you know, 20 of them are children, <laughs> right? you can't, you can't, it's really hard to be picky, you know? And so somebody comes along and they seem nice and they probably got kids of their own and, um, you know, they, they've got a testimony and all this stuff and, and you just, you just figure it's fine. Right. These are, so, these are people who sit next to me in the pew. How bad can they be? Exactly. The yeah. But exactly. We're, we're waking up and we're starting to realize this is a huge issue. Yeah. And um, I, I guess what message would you say to people who are still in denial? This can't, I, <laughs> oh, fine. This, this happens at maybe some Baptist church, but not mine. This happens, sure. at church, but not mine. It can't possibly happen where I'm at because I, I know these people. Well, I would just encourage them to read their Bibles and observe sin. Um, you know, even in uh, Jesus' little circle of disciples, there were 12 disciples and one of them betrayed him. Mm. So this is, um, you know, this is, this is not a uh, freaky situation. This is not unusual. This is not something that nobody saw coming. This is just life in a fallen world. You know, uh, if one out of 12 disciples was a Judas then odds are somebody in your church, even if it's a tiny church, um, somebody in your church uh, is willing to betray you. And, you know, we need to be wise to that. And, and we need to not, um, we need to not look at the world uh, or the church through rosy colored glasses, because I'm afraid that's exactly what Satan wants. And so what really shocks me about this, it, it's not, unfortunately, it's not the fact that abuse happens. Because mm -hmm. it's painfully obvious. But what upsets me greatly is the cover-up. Yes. The fact that, that men and women that I trust, leaders in the church, have decided not to report this. Yeah. We'll deal with this internally. And so now we have a situation where the church isn't even made aware. The authorities mm -hmm. are not made aware. And so this abuser is now free. Maybe he'll leave that church, but with a with no one reporting anything, he's free to go somewhere else and start this process all over again. Yep. How just how sickening is that? That 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 that. Why aren't we more outraged at that? Um, I don't know. Honestly, I find that almost. I mean, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but that's almost more offensive to me than the fact that abusers infiltrate the church, because it's like, I, I expect evil people to do evil things. Right. When I see Christians or supposed Christians, it really makes me question their, the genuineness of their faith, honestly, yeah. because they're becoming complicit. When you cover up abuse, you're becoming complicit. It's just like when you cover up any other crime, whether it be theft or murder or what, what have you, it, you can't do these things things. And especially um, at the risk of endangering more children. You know, it's just, um, there are just simply no words. Um, I, I really think that, you know, we're living in a time where um, the hearts of, of many are being revealed for, for who they really are. Um, and, and that's a frightening thought. It's frightening. It's exciting in the sense that I really hope Jesus is going to come back soon, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's also terrifying because <laughs> I'm not sure what Jesus defines soon as, 
I just yeah. really don't want to see things get any worse than, than they are. I don't like the way they are now. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's incredibly disturbing. And one thing that I've found, um, really shocking to me, actually, it's, you know, you, you, we talk a lot about mandatory reporter laws. Um, whenever abuse comes up in the church, we talk about, you know, state laws and whether or not church leaders are mandatory reporters. In Texas, where I'm from, they are mandatory reporters, but there's a catch. If they break state law, there's no repercussions. Mm. So it's like they're immune to the repercussions. So it's like, what's the point of even having the right. law? There is no law in practical service. Right. It, it's just effectively, it's just a I don't know. It's, it's so there's, there's layers of frustration here for me. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm hopeful uh, for with the Southern Baptist convention is that, you know, they have commissions such as the ERLC right. uh, that work to influence public policy. And I'm really hoping and praying that they do something where they try to influence public policy to better protect abuse victims both inside and outside the church you know make no. make clergy mandatory reporters make sure that if they break state law they can get punished you know and and uh you know edit some of these laws that just really you know for example statutes of limitations on certain types of child abuse it's just there are a lot of things that the church could really do to to not only make amends for the incredible lapses in care, uh, but also to improve the world around us, to, to be a testimony to, to our communities, to our nation, because, you know, it, I feel that in the church, especially with these cover-ups, we've been doing the bare minimum to even follow the law. Yeah. But that's not the way the church should be. The church, I mean, we're not called to follow the law. We're called to follow to follow Christ, right. you know, so how much more should we be doing to prevent and, and respond well to cases of such clear and present evil? Um, I just, you know, to, to see pastors in churches arguing about whether or not they should report crime, it's just mind boggling to me. And to be clear, this is not an issue of church discipline. This isn't someone who merely um, does not believe the, the right doctrine or has defrauded a brother, but this is a, a this is a criminal issue. Yes, that needs to and be brought to a, a court of law or or absolutely. law enforcement. And it's also you know it's not just a singular sin that you can just repent of and be forgiven for. Right. Abuse is a cluster of sins that have been going on for a very long time. So you know a lot of times by the time someone is capable of harming a child or beating their wife or what have you, by the time they get to that level of evil, they've already committed a series of sins that led up to this. They've been snowballing towards this for years, probably decades. So you're talking about someone who's been probably looking at porn, probably illicit kinds of porn, probably, uh, you know, living in all sorts of different kinds of sin from anger to deception, to self-deception, to pride. And all of this is kind of built up and built up and built up over many years. And it's finally exploded to the point that they have the gall and the shamelessness to inflict their evil on someone else. And so we can't just be satisfied with, oh, well, pervy Pete, you know, he said he's sorry. And so we should forgive him. No, no, no. That's, that's not how this works at all, because this is a person who's been living in unrepentant sin. And that is a clear sign that they're probably not saved. Because Christians repent. Christians feel shame right. for their sins. You know, for someone to, uh, to live in this kind of repeated, ongoing, chronic sin for so long until they got to this point. I mean, they're, they're whacking you upside the head with red flags. Mm. So you, you mentioned the ERLC on Southern Baptist Convention. And there's many in the convention yes. that want to take away um that that committee which is still shocking and you know you <laughs> the forward of your book is written by russell moore uh yeah. one of my heroes but basically 
uh, ran off. Um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately. So I, I don't know if there's, I, I'm really praying that there is some genuine repentance as, as a convention of how yeah. things have been dealt with in real change, but, but I've got my doubts. Um, one of the other, as we unpeel this, this onion, one of the other layers is something that you've gone through personally. And I'm, I'm still shocked that this happens, but not only are we not dealing with abusers, but oftentimes victims have been made to feel guilty themselves mm-hmm. as yes. if maybe it's their fault or maybe it's not even their fault, but man, bringing this up, that that's going to hurt the reputation of the church. That's going to mm-hmm. hurt our witness. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about, about that? You know, that's, it's, it's a really pernicious evil um, throughout the church. I have, I actually have emails and screen captures of Facebook messages of people who I knew from previous churches who are just saying that just ridiculous lies, you know, that I'm, I'm mentally ill. I'm delusional. I don't, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. I dreamed all this stuff up. I'm a liar. And, you know, there's, uh, oh, what was the, what, how do they put it? They said that there were discrepancies in my story, but then when they were asked, well, what discrepancies? Oh, I can't remember. Or, oh, I don't want to say, oh. I don't want to bad mouth her. This is like, seriously. <laughs> so, um, so, but this kind of thing happens and, you know, it goes back to the cover-ups. Uh, these people are becoming complicit in, um, in evils that they don't even understand. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, like my abuse happened back in my childhood. So for a person to, you know, come forward now, someone who doesn't even know my dad doesn't even, wasn't even there when it happens for them to be coming up now and saying, oh, well, I think, you know, I think she's a liar and I think she's crazy. It's like, what are you doing? You know, I, I just, I really can't understand that. I think that it has to come down to their, they think that they're protecting the reputation of the church or maybe of a pastor. I I don't know. Um, but it, it's, it's incredibly evil. And, and I really think that it is demonic. There's, there's patterns in the behavior, uh, that I see happen in many different churches, uh, things that are said and done against many different victims and survivors, and they all follow the same patterns. And to me, that's just a sign that, you know, we're in a state of spiritual war here where, um, You know, people who speak the truth are being called, uh, are being called liars. You know, it's that Bible verse where it says they've exchanged the truth for a lie. I'm afraid that's what we're seeing. I I don't have any other explanation for it because it's really, it's crazy. I think we all, we all dream for the day that revival hits the church or hits our nation and all that. But in order for that to happen, sin has to be exposed. Yeah. God's not going to work while unrepentant hidden sin is allowed to run rampant. And I think this may be part of that process where uh, you, you you wrote an article about this and we're going to link to that in our show notes, but this is just a tip of the iceberg. We haven't seen everything that there is to see. Um, And so more of this has to come out. And in order for you that churches have to start being honest yeah, and we have to create an atmosphere where victims can feel safe to come forward to expose this. Mm-hmm. What what steps should we take to create that atmosphere? What can you know? Maybe you don't have faith in the SBC or the OPC or any other uh, denomination or acronym you want to throw out there. Sure. But within the individual churches, mm-hmm. what steps can they take to begin to be real about this problem and 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 begin to be able to offer the help that people need? Yeah. I think that one of the big steps that needs to be taken on a local level is simply reporting crimes to law enforcement and then publicly talking about, okay, this is, this is what we've done. This is why we did it. This is why you need to protect your children from so-and-so. This is why you need to not, you know, invite him over around your kids um, and just be vocal about these things. And, you know, the other thing I think is that the church seems to be hyper-focusing on sexual abuse, 
that's really dangerous because um, a lot of abusers, uh, they may not have been caught committing sexual crimes, um, but there will be there will be other crimes that they're guilty of, whether that be domestic violence or some other form of abuse. And so we need to be vocal about these things. I mean, one of the one of the things that I personally look for in a church whenever I visit a church is okay. Um, tell me about a recent case of domestic violence or child abuse or sexual abuse or what have you. Tell me about what happened and how you handled it. And if they can tell me, oh yeah, we had, um, we had this situation where this happened and we reported this to law enforcement. Right then my level, I, well, I don't know if I just say my trust in them goes up, but my ability to potentially trust them <laughs> It's greatly increased because I know that they've handled this before, that their eyes are open, that they are taking the necessary steps to protect people in their congregation. Um, whereas if I visit, say, a church that, you know, has been around for a while, it's fairly good size. And I say, hey, you know, um, have you ever had a case of abuse? And they're like, oh, no, that, you know, we haven't had that happen here in a long time. That's a red flag to me that either they have no idea what to look for or they're lying mm. because it's just not possible. Right. What are those things to look for? What, what are some uh, other red flags we look at from, from the church perspective? If I'm, a, if I'm a pastor or church leader, sure. um, what are some things I need to be aware of that I, that, that should be ooh, red flag? I got to look at that. I got to investigate that. Yeah, I think, you know, it's hard to say because one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that how diverse cases of abuse can be, hmm. you know, anytime we're dealing with uh, people, there's personalities, there's situations, there's different kinds of relationships. Uh, generally speaking, I would look for um, controlling relationships. If you notice that um, someone is unusually controlling of their family or, um, for example, their, uh, their kids or their wife or whoever seems to kind of look to them before they respond to a question or before they do anything, you know, before they get involved in a Bible study or what have you. There's just, um, I would say controlling is a big red flag. Um, gossip is another. If you have someone who is coming to you and telling you things that you don't feel that you should know about other people. Um, and that's a big one in the church. You know, people will come to you with prayer requests. They call them prayer requests. Um, but really it's, it's a way to kind of discredit someone or uh, make them look bad or spread rumors. And so we have to be very sensitive to these issues. It's like, well, is this a genuine prayer request or is, or is, am I being manipulated to turn against this person? And so, um, that's another one. Gossip is another one. And I see that very commonly uh, in, in churches where abuse is covered up. There's a lot of gossip. Well, Jennifer, I want to thank you for your time. We're, we're running out of time, um, but and there's so much more again, we could talk about. Oh, I know. Um, and I could talk for hours. Yeah. So <laughs> just cut me want, off. <laughs> I do want to recommend uh, your latest blog piece, uh, SBC guidepost report, analyzing recommendations to prevent abuse and help victims. We'll have a link to that. And of course your book, uh, not forsaken, uh, yeah. a story of life after abuse. I know you've got another book coming out next year. Yes. And, um, I'm excited. hoping you're going to come and talk, chat with us about that. Next Absolutely. Year. No doubt. All right. And so be, be, honored. be in prayer for the Southern Baptist convention as they have to deal with issues, but also be in prayer for your church and, and yes. looking for some of these signs and uh, this this is going to turn around one church at a time. It's not going to be a big denominational thing. But when individual people start to care and start to show uh, the love that Christ commands us to show, uh, that's when we can begin to really make a difference and see things turn around. So, Jennifer, thank you for Amen. all that you've done and for speaking out and for the abuse you take on Twitter um, and other <laughs> places. Uh, thank you for your ministry. Thanks so much, Kevin. I really appreciate your time. All right. Well, thank all of you for listening. So join us back next week. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking. We're, we're going to get back to, I promise we're going to do it this week, but we'll get back to um, our series about things not to say to your pastor. 
a uh, list of things that we've, we've actually cataloged and, and real people have said to real pastors. And we're going to talk about that again next week. So until then, have a great rest of your week. Check us out, www.basicbiblepodcast.org. Uh,